Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa and thank you for staying with us. Our you know, next major conversation this morning is going to be, of course, reactions to President Muhammad Buhari's uh, statements yesterday, um, where, of course, uh, he threatens to deal with those who are misbehaving um, and, of course, um, have forgotten you know, what happened in the Civil War and some of all of that. He also spoke about um, INEC offices being destroyed and said that they will support INEC and provide everything necessary for the elections to still hold in 2023. And uh, there will be no third term, according to you know, the statements from the President. We're speaking this morning with uh, Ikemesit F. Young, uh, the head of research, SBM Intelligence and also Nicolas Sibekwe, an investigative journalist. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Ibekwe. Yeah. Uh, the reactions to the president's tweets, mostly on social media, for those who didn't also see the video clips, um, have been, of course, very, very wild. I'll tell you in a second. A lot of people have uh, complained, um, you know, that it didn't seem presidential, uh, you know, to put out a statement like that. Do you, do you agree or do you think that, you know, this was necessary with regards the events in the Southeast in the last few weeks? Well, um, it was not only unnecessary. I think it was a reprehensible statement that the that uh, president put out. Um, yes, there have been... Um, Insecurity um, in the southeast. People have been uh, been killed. Most of these um, uh, killings have been um, blamed on on the unknown government. But I basically think that there is something like an unknown government. These are those um, IPOP or ESN um, uh, ESN, which is the IPOP militia carrying out targeted attack um, on police stations and INEC offices, which was the reason why the uh, president. Um, uh, tweeted in the first place, or the reason for the meeting from which it, he he tweeted. But um, going back to the president's statement, it, it is quite um, unpresidential. It is quite irreprehensible. I think every Nigerian should come out and condemn the statement because we need to break down that statement to understand what the president was trying to do by putting out that statement. The president was going back 50 years back to to unarguably. The, 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 the Nigerian Southern history. I mean, this is the darkest history of the country, the civil, war, the civil War. We've not had anything as bad as the Civil War. He went back that, that far to bring that statement because he has this triumphant um, attitude about him and the Civil War, about, I mean, for a particular region. What he was saying, basically, was that a war that, that is generally referred to I mean, considered to be a genocidal war, mm -hmm. over 3 million evils. I mean, overwhelming number of them were civilians. Over 90% of those of that number were civilians, were killed. Most of them died of starvation. Um, and it was not a starvation that was, I mean, it was a deliberate state-sponsored starvation then. Um, he was going back, there was rape, there was total destruction of the evil heartland, and the president is going back to make reference to that. And look at his choice of word. We would teach them in the language they understand. What does he mean by that? Basically, he was saying that, oh, older Igbos did not tell the younger Igbos the horror of the war. We would revisit that war. We will revisit the horror of that war to them so that they can know what that means. That is basically what the president is saying. And this is a, this is a country that is a deeply divided country. And any sane person at this time should be seeking reconciliation, should be, seeking, should be looking at building bridges rather than okay. deepening the division that, that um, has turned the, the, the uh, country into, a, into, into the security mess that it, it is right now. Okay. So um, there is no, I don't know where those who think it was presidential, I don't know what they were reading. It wasn't written in Eskimo Spanish. It was written in English. I mean, it wasn't an ambiguous statement. It was a clear court statement that the president made. I mean, that's not, I hate when people start beating ab, 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 about the bush. It was, it was bad, it was reprehensible. It was not no way around. There's no way to look at it. There's no positive you can take from that statement. Honestly, I don't see. Okay, um, let's bring in Mr. Effion. Mr. Effion, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, so the newspapers this morning were flooded with statements from President Muhammad Buhari 
and he said he would shock terrorists and shock all those who are, you know, instigating a violence and insecurity in Nigeria. But should Nigerians find any succor in those messages? Um, if recent experience in terms of how the conduct of security of the security authorities have been right in terms of countering these elements, then I don't think that there is much space for you know anyone acquiring any sort of conf um, so-called comforts. Fact of the matter remains that um, you are dealing with a you, we are in a multi-dimensional you know security paradigm right right now where the country is confronting confronting at least seven significant security security threats and each threat has its own unique profile right and demands you know uh, it, it bespoke right you know and you know and an individual individualized uh, a response and but what you've seen from um policy makers you know you know primarily you know chair led by by the president right is, is that there appears to be a one-size-fits-all um approach right um to, to to our security problems and uh that that is you know that leaves a lot of that leaves a lot of room for comfort in, in a region like the southeast which you know has a historical hangover right with you know how the deployment of violence you know has um, led to the achievement of certain political um, outcomes right historically you would have expect, expected that the tone right of the president's comments uh, uh, would have been attuned right to that heightened sense of sensitivity the southeast isn't like any you know um, other region probably you could argue maybe the south south comes close right in terms of you know how organized and state-sponsored violence has been consistently deployed against residents you know of, of that region and you'd expect any nigerian president and not just this president but any nigerian president who has the slightest understanding right of you know this country's historical context to be acutely aware about how he communicates his priorities right to and you know and, and concerning and concerning that region i didn't see that from the president's comments yesterday and so furthermore you're also dealing right with a president right that has a fundamental a fundamentally skewed perception right of of how security issues should be addressed mm -hmm. this is you know largely as a result of you know you know his his background right in the military fed also and, and also you know um, largely um, contextualized by his own experience right of the civil war obviously being you know on the federal nigerian side of things and he hasn't been very shy about communicating how you know that bias right has informed you know not not only his thinking but also you know overall decision making especially with respect to you know issues around um the southeast so you'd have expected you know that his mind has or you know other members of his policy making circle would have been able to intervene to at least you know garnish or properly define you know what his comments you, um, you know would have been and let's take note of the fact that the president rarely speaks out on issues concerning security so anything which you know he eventually comes out to say right you know acquires a heightened sense of you know importance and will be seen and perceived you know by nigerians right with with a higher degree you know um, of sensitivity and for him to have come out and said the things he had said the way you know he said them right in the context and the manner in which we said them on the platform in which in which he said he said it right just you know is a classic textbook case of you know how not to understand and how not to communicate your non-understanding of a very very sensitive situation wow. all right back to uh mr ibekwe um is there a possibility uh that Maybe people are um, misinterpreting the words and the tone with which the president spoke. That's one. And then second, what are your biggest fears with regards um, the actions that can be taken after such a statement is made? Um, what are the fears that people across the country, maybe particularly in the southeast, should have um, with the president drawing up narratives from uh, the Civil War and saying, you know, that they will be taught lessons or they will be treated in ways that they, they know best or they understand. Um, what fears do you have as a citizen? Um, the, 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 let's take the, the part of people misinterpreting um, what the president has said. Because, I mean, the, the thing with most people is that um, there's always a pattern. 
I mean, most people, as human beings, we, we walk with our pattern. And why most people get what people say is wrong is because they have refused to do a deep pattern. Most people take their statement I mean, at the face value and try to interpret it. But let's go back to what we have seen. Since six years ago that this president has come, uh, I mean, has been sworn in, what has been his, what has been his responses to issue, security issues in the Southeast? It has been heavy-handed from the word go. This is not, let's not joke about this. This is not the first time the president has made reference to the civil war and the role he played in the civil war in relation to security challenges in the Southeast. This is not the first time. This is just the most egregious of all of those statements mm. that he has made. Now, what has, like, let's go back to his response. What has been his response? His response has always been that of deploying the military, deploying soldiers. We have, we have let's not forget that very recently, the Inspector General of Police basically gave policemen a blank check to shoot at anybody in Imo State. That is, that is in the South. That is the epicenter of this violence in Oweri. He gave the police, and he told them that when the question of human rights abuses arises, that he knows what to do to handle all of that. That is the recently appointed IG of the police, who reports to the president. So let's take it that he's the commander in chief. He will not make such a statement if he has not gotten the, the, I mean, the backing of his boss to say, go and do this. Now, the president is coming out to say this. So there is no ambiguity here. OK. Now, for those in the Southeast, if I was in the South, because the Southeast is caught in a whirlwind of violence. Now, the Kanu and his ECN uh, militia are also perpetrating violence. That is fear. We saw the sit at home order. I can tell you for a fact that this is not the first time Namdekanu will call for a sit at home order. Why is it that the sit at home order this time was total? And why is it that the other sit at home orders have not been that successful? You know, the, the, the changing, the, the only changing dynamics here is the introduction of the militia ESN, IPOP militia ESN. It has gone around causing mayhem, intimidating people, and creating fear. So people sat down at home, not because. They, not because they, they didn't want to go and do their business or something, or because they support Namdi Kanu that much. If you go to the Southeast now, people will tell you that people are worried that Namdi Kanu and iPod are bringing violence to his own town, to his <laughs> own, I mean, to his home state, I mean, to his own region. People are basically worried. A lot of people will tell you in hot voices. I mean, a few weeks ago, I traveled around the Southeast, and people will tell you in hot voices that they are, they are worried. That they, they really don't support ESN. But what do they do? People can't come out to challenge them the camel because even the security forces that should protect people are even under attack by the ESN. They can't even protect their, their stations. You know? So where do you go to? So if I was in the Southeast right now, I would be very worried. We have seen Operation Python dance, Ego AK had one, two, three or so. Now we have a uh, Operation Restore Peace or something, which is a little ball, a little bit uh, with uh, my in its language, but it is still the same thing. It is rest of peace. We are the, is in the, in the, in the operation rest of peace that the IG basically gave policemen the blank check to shoot at, I mean, to kill anybody and don't care about human rights ab ab abuse. And don't forget that the context here is that the Nigerian security is like, I mean, they act like carpenter. When they see a problem, they think hammer and they think nail, just hit it on, on, on its head. That is the only solution they, they have to solve any, any problem. Force, force and more force. If that more force is not enough, enough, triple the force and okay. add more force. Okay. That, 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 that is what the Nigerian security operative understands. Mr. 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 Ebekwe, I need to ask you this question because I want us to take a look away from what the president is saying to what mm -hmm. he is doing or not doing. We know mm. that the president has, you know, military experience, military background. And when he came into the country, you know, he wrote on the manifesto of tackling corruption and fighting insurgency and insecurity. But looking at how security has worsened since President Muhammad Buhari became president in 2015, well, would you say you're maybe shocked or disappointed to see that despite his military experience, he doesn't seem to have a grip on security? I wasn't sure. I'm not shocked at anything this president is doing. I'm not shocked. Some of us know that this government was going to be, I mean, an abysmal failure. I mean, it goes back to patterns again. People don't understand this pattern. 
I mean, go back to the first coming of Mohammed Buhari as the military era. That was, until now, that was the time we faced the worst economic crisis in this country. Rice, sugar, everyday staple was being rationed. I mean, people queue up to get ration, to buy ration of rice and sugar in the past. This happened under Buhari. Let's not go into all of, all of that. But again, what we are seeing here, if we are seeing a man who basically is, he has failed. He can't take care of um, security in the Northeast. Hmm. The whole of the Northwest is being run around by terrorists that some people call bandits. Look at Southeast. Nam Dikanu has become the most influential person in the Southeast. And his ESN people are, 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 are spreading the campaign of fear, I mean, are, are among the people. The police and the army are in five and six. Nobody, I mean, are in, are in six and sevens. So nobody knows what is happening. It's a total philosophy. I am not shocked. I am really, I'm not sure because go back to Buhari. What has he, what, I mean, when he left, what did he do since he left as a military leader in the 80s? What, what did he do to update his knowledge? Is he in tune with modern solution of, 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 of problem solving or conflict solving, of tackling security? Even the country, the biggest army in the world, the USA, sometimes will solve better and seek um, 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 alternative measure um, to, I mean, to conflict resolution other than, than in violence. But what, what have you seen here? Is violence, violence, and more violence, okay. add more violence, add more All violence. right, all right, Mr. Ibeke. Um, Mr. Efiong, I want to ask you this same question to say, how do you score President Muhammad Buhari's uh, hold on security vis-a-vis -vis his military experience? Um, I, abysmal would be the, the word that comes, that comes to mind. The fact of the matter is that um, in 2015, there was a unique opportunity, at, at least, you know, if you take the optimistic view, right, about the president, for him to, to reach out to every part of this country and to, um, to build the kind of consensus that would have, which is required in democracies to begin with, but that would have also served him well in terms of, you know, how do you win the hearts and minds, right, of people, not just in the Southeast, but across the country, right, and, you know, get them on board, right, in uh, supporting your agenda. He has done none of that, you know, he, 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 has, he has had a guns first, tanks first, military first approach, right, to um, resolving issues which have structural drivers which are not violence, which have structural drivers which are not rooted in insecurity, which have structural drivers which are rooted in the social and economic contradictions that continue to define this country. He has done nothing to address those issues. His economic policy thinking, which is a feeder point to whatever kind of security containment or countering strategy that you would have had, right, has been peace poor to, uh, to, to say the least. Nigerians are poorer now than they were in 2015, which is saying something <laughs> because we were quite poor in 2015. Mm -hmm. And so on, on whichever lever you look at it, there is very, very little for you to point at, right, that you can use as an anchor point to give the president a good grade on insecurity, mm -hmm. on the economy, or just general policy thinking. Mm -hmm. And as long as this current state of affairs continues to persist, there is nothing to indicate that we we that any of these issues right will be de-escalated anytime soon. If anything, we are on an escalatory path. And I think that's very worrying, not just for people in the Southeast, but especially for people in that region, but for Nigerians everywhere in this country. All right, Mr. Afeng, I'm staying with you. I I, I want um you know your thoughts on um the point where it is expected to be the responsibility of the of uh, the Nigerian government, President Mohamed Buhari, and the security agencies to ensure that they track down and they apprehend everyone who has been responsible for destruction of INEC offices and police stations and those attacks. Um, the tweets and you know the things that we're speaking about this morning are they uh, you know an evidence of failure in that regard? Um, and, of course, taking a totally different approach instead of, of course, sticking to what your responsibility should have been. Um, that's one. And then second, um, speak also on his um, statement with regards to INEC. Um, it says, uh, I have a short INEC that would make available to them everything they need to operate efficiently so that no one would say we don't want to go or that we want a third term. 
Okay, um, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with the second point, right? Because the second point, point is pretty easy to knock down. There are lots of people that have had fears. As a matter of fact, there are people who have theories that the security situation in the Southeast is in part orchestrated to make the region right so inconducive to any form of democratic practice that, you know, elections would essentially be dispensed with or the government would exercise its constitutional powers to declare a state of emergency or martial law in parts of or in large parts of you know, of, of the country, right, come election time. And the fact of the matter remains that, you know, nobody in Asorok has done anything or said anything to disabuse that perspective. That's telling, that's concerning, and concerning the, you know, considering the long arm, right, of Nigerian history, that's not unprecedented. And I think that's what worries, you know, those of us who actually, you know, look at these issues or monitor these issues for a living. To, to the second point, um, you could make the argument that, um, if anything, the government is working into the hands of, you know, dissidents and separatist movements like IPOB, right, and militias, you know, like the ESN, in um, keep giving them a, a, a cursus belli, really. You know, so when the tone of, you know, the the conversation, right, or the narrative coming out of the government is non-conciliatory, is belligerent, is, you know, up in arms and basically telling every element that is countering it that it's ready to, you know, to use that Nigerianism to meet fire for fire, you're only going to perpetrate and deepen the level of hostility, right, against you. And you've seen this clearly, right, there's a clear trend in terms of how the government has tried to manage the IPOP issue since 2015. So prior to Buhari, under Jonathan, Biafra was essentially ignored by everybody. Ignored by everyone in Asura. Ignored by everybody in the Southeast. Ignored by anyone, right, who had anything, you know, close to a political head. But under Buhari, you've seen narrative after counter-narrative. You've seen element, you've seen efforts through the courts, through the security authorities, first the police and then the military, right, to actively, you know, suppress this movement. And that's actually elevated the status of this group, right, from just a fringe non-relevance to a cult group, which is increasingly, like Nicholas has, you know, actually pointed out, you know, owning and dominating the narrative. And so even though they still find on, on the larger, you know, scale of things, you know, relatively little support, right, within and outside the Southeast, they've been able to own the narrative to the point where they have significantly discolored the conversation and so everybody starts from a standpoint of what are we going to do to deal with ipop they've owned the conversation to that extent and the government is just merely playing into his hands by coming out and issuing these statements which let's be clear ipop and esm will take and use as propaganda materials ipop and esm will take and use right as even more evidence that the nigerian state is out to disabuse and to counter the legitimate quote and unquote aspirations right of this movement and that's only going to lead to more radicalism it's going to lead to more recruitment on their part and it's only going to worsen the overall security picture so whichever way you look at it from a message and a policy making standpoint right the government could have done a lot better to manage this issue okay it's only if anything emboldened these actors all right I, I i want to follow up on what you just said you know how do you suggest the government does about it what should be the message rather than this you know tough speaking high-handedness so to speak what should the government be saying to nigerians at this time okay right so um even though ipop is you know um if, if you look at a broad political spectrum of the issues which are important to the Southeast, IPOP has taken one very far end, right, of that spectrum, which is that, you know, um, being part of Nigeria does nothing to advance the cause of the Igbo ethnic group. Our best bet is to leave Nigeria. But that political spectrum is what it is. It's a spectrum. There are long-standing demands, right, mm -hmm. by all sorts, you know, of political and economic and cultural elements within the Southeast that have not been properly engaged with and addressed by the Nigerian state. Mm -hmm. If you go a long way towards having that political conversation, towards making concessions 
towards decentralizing power to the point where you know power centers not just in the southeast but in every part of the country feel an ownership and a participation in the shaping of their destiny okay. you've gone a long way towards you know delegitimizing the cause of separatist movement and so in the end this issue is not just a security issue it's a political issue it's an economic issue and the government needs to begin to engage on those long-standing aspirations and demands. Okay, Mr. Ibokwe. By... All right, Mr. 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 Ibokwe. Yes. Do, do you agree with um, your colleague when he says that what we actually need is devolution of powers, and we need to the government needs to begin to, um, you know, dialogue and solve whatever it is that is making these people agitate for a separate country? Yeah, I mean, um, I just tweeted it that. Um, um, some minutes before I, I came here, okay. we need to seize it. We need to seize the narrative from Namdi Kano and his extremist view. I mean, but, I mean, but, but by using false and jack book, uh, jack boot method that this government had done since 2015, um, we are just playing into the hands of Namdi Kano. I remember in 2011 or 20, as a young reporter then, I was traveling to the southeast, and you will see the flag of. Massov, the ID, Biafran flag, all over the South, is on the major roads. But the Biafran architecture was not, I mean, was not a major issue then. That was Massov, but people didn't take them for, for I mean, people, they had their group, like, like um, Ikemesi said, this was a fringe group that never gathered the kind of support that they needed. But look at what has happened since we decided that we have to squash them by all means and all of that. So I think we should be building bridges now. See the narrative from, from because there are moderate, that people in, in the evil heartland who are who are concerned, who have like you can also said, who have also gave there's a long list of marginal concern about marginalization, about stuff that in, that Southeast people have been asking for several years, even before this government. Has this government made any move to address any of them? No. So the only thing it does is to use force and it's not gonna work. So so, so I, Mr. Ibokwe. Right. Mr. Ibokwe. Violence or force. Mr. Um, I, I want you to also then speak on um, Namdi Kanu um, mm. and you know ways that he can put out his message, you know, in a you know a lot better. The um, ESN stroke IPOB doesn't necessarily have a voice in the southeast um, or anybody who speaks for them. Um, there's a certain Ima powerful that once in a while puts out statements, you know, but um, there's nobody who can speak on their behalf and say, yes, we are responsible for the attacks in the Southeast, or no, we have no hand whatsoever. We're not a military, a militarized group. We don't have, you know, arms and ammunition. Uh, these attacks are being carried out by other elements, and, you know, we are, of course, being painted as uh, the perpetrators. Um, so, it, it, do you think that that is necessary? Do you think that Namdi Kanu himself, you know, should be able to change the tone of his um, uh, speech? And also, res the responsibility of the Southeast leadership, governors, House of Assembly um, uh, members, uh, National Assembly members, I, I, I beg your pardon, and also their traditional um, leaders at a time like this, Arnez and um, and the likes. Where do they come in? Let me quickly, let me quickly dispel one misconception. Nam the Kanu has made statements repeatedly, and he's still making statements about the nature of these attacks, about how they are how they should be carried out, and how they should be done. There are statements all over the internet of him be saying that army soldiers should be killed, police stations should be attacked. So there is no there is no confusion about who is responsible for all of this. Those who are saying that because they have not come to claim responsibility for particular, I mean, for um, specific attack, it doesn't mean that they are the ones are just burying their head in the sand like ostrich. I mean, um, um, the, 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 the thing here is, again, the other thing again, Namdi Khan is not somebody you can have a conversation with. Yeah. I mean, have you tried to have a debate with any, an IPOP member, even in Lagos here? Yeah. I, I have. have tried. It's, it's, it's a dead end. They, it's, it's impossible to reason with. So we are not going to talk to Unam the Kanu and his supporters. Rather, we are going to seize the narrative from him by, by, by boycotting him and by creating other channels, other incentives. Like, I mean, what Ikemesi just said, by addressing some of these concerns that have been there for years, by start to doing all of that, 
The Southeast has complaints of several things. Yeah, but, but who, who should do that? And, and that's the reason I'm asking about Southeast political the leadership. Should, nobody, nobody should do that. The government should do that. But the government has ignored this other, I mean, um, this other concern. And as they said, that the, the government has, like um, Kevin said, the this government, Buhari is still fighting a war that ended 50 years ago. Great. So, so, since, so since that has been established, Mr. Ibekwe, um, and yes. it doesn't seem like the Buhari administration will be able to understand the perspectives that you've put out. It doesn't also seem like there's a lot of people in the administration who can, you know, advise that they take a totally different approach from what they're taking now. What is the role of the Southeast political traditional leadership um, at a time like this? The, 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 the reason why Namikano you know, has also become this popular is also partly because of the feeling of Southeast politicians who are endemically corrupt, who are in there for what they, they can, who have left their region to degenerate to this extent. So, because the South East leaders don't have legitimacy, I mean, in the eyes of many Igbos, these are the leaders are as bad as the Buhari um, um, government in the central. Then look at what is happening in, um, in Imo states. This, most of these people don't have the legitimacy. They've scorned at their people. So it's hard for them to come back and start appealing to their, their people. What we can do now is to find influential people who are not in government who are not i mean in, who are very very neutral okay. who could appeal to people who could start movement ngos should set in there and we need to start creating a different narrative from the one that the federal government has put forward and the, also the one that um, um, um Namdekano has also put forward the southeast has found the people of the southeast are basically i mean between a, a rock and a hard place right now so we need somebody to come there and extricate them from that, I mean, tough position that they find themselves. I'm okay. not looking towards the politician in the Southeast or Hanese. Look at this statement. Have you seen any Southeast politician coming to condemn it? Nobody would say anything. I mean, I mean, um, several months ago, they announced that they were going to form a Bubiago. What have they done? What, how long did it take the South Westerners to, to South Western go governor to set up and protect? Mm -hmm. No, no one of them has sent in a bill to the to the set of assembly to legitimize to legitimize um, uh, a Bubagu. They are they are, they are playing the fire brigade. Just yesterday they had a, a, an emergency meeting saying they are going to do this. Going to do that. That's what they have been doing. They have lost initiative. They don't have le le legitimacy. So it's difficult to look at that. So we have to look at alternative. Um, 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 approaches to solving this problem. Okay. Look at people who are not in government um, to begin to bring up a different narrative from what um, Nabdekanu and, and the cop and, and, and politicians both in the work and in the states, uh, in, the, in the government houses in the state in the South is are putting forward. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Iwekwe and Mr. Efiong, we'll come back to you both in just a minute. Let's take a quick break. So do stay with us on The Breakfast.